and welcome back to my video series on a theory of consciousness. At the end of the previous video, I'd set the stage for the next step towards my mid-chasm conceptual scheme. We started with a very general sketch, one way of looking at how it feels to be a first-person self. I then modified it somewhat and grounded it with a very basic nod to neurology. Let's now resume and try to move this concept or scheme closer to the center of the explanatory chasm that we're trying to bridge to provide a more reasonable model of how the neurological brain produces a first-person self, as well as a plausible target for modeling and simulation. So, in this new scheme, instead of two screens, we have two modules, one pertaining to external activity and one pertaining to internal memory-related activity. Like the previous schemes, there's still an element in the middle. This time, however, it's called the central activating system. More on this later. So let's start on the left side, in this area labeled data primitives or primrons. In essence, the activity that occurs in this area corresponds with our fundamental letters of experience. If the objects and situations we experience are analogous to sentences and paragraphs, primrons are the actual letters, or qualia. From a neurological perspective, the activity of these primrons would correspond to the activity of the neural columns found in our various sensory maps in the brain. The most straightforward examples pertain to our senses of taste and smell. We could imagine having a primron for smell of smoke, another for smell of rubbing alcohol, and so on. Our senses of taste and smell are by far our simplest. They're fairly one-dimensional. We could generally say that a certain odor is very strong, non-existent, or somewhere in between in terms of intensity. Pretty simple. Our senses of hearing and vision are much different, with vision being the most complex. Unlike our sense of smell, we don't just experience vision as if we live in a dense monochromatic fog that slowly changes color. No, we live in a world of visual scenes. These scenes consist of fields of colors, different colors that are bounded by edges and borders. These fields and edges move, sometimes in front of other fields, sometimes behind others. Sometimes they move closer, sometimes away. Sometimes they rotate or change orientation as they're moving, and sometimes they move into areas where there's less light or more light or colored light. The main point here, without going too far off topic, is that when it comes to visual primrons as well as auditory primrons, it isn't as easy and straightforward as it is for our senses of taste and smell. There are substantial dedicated areas in our brain that do a lot of the heavy mental lifting and pre-processing necessary to make sense of our visual worlds. And I simply acknowledge this neurological reality by including these placeholders here. In other words, when it comes to vision, it may be tempting to ask why our primrons aren't the individual pixels that are perceived by our individual photoreceptors on the back of our retinas. Well, it's basically because we don't have access that far upstream in the process. Instead, we'll assume that examples of visual primrons would include visual fields, vertical lines, horizontal edges, and movement. Similarly, for our tactile modality, we'll assume that the pre-processing sections filter for patterns like grip size, sponginess, surface texture, and temperature. So that's what I mean by data primitives or primrons. They're the fundamental units of sensory experience by which we decipher or interpret our environment. Before we proceed, I want to say that I've intentionally made this diagram extremely simplistic so that we don't get dragged down with the details. For instance, I'm intentionally leaving out the senses of hearing and taste, and we know that we have far more primrons than what's shown here. There are a number of other caveats that I'll address eventually, but for the time being, the objective is to keep the diagram as simple as possible. On the right side, there's an area that is basically a duplicate of what's on the left. In essence, there's a one-to-one -one mapping or correspondence and a one-way connection between the primrons on the left and the duplicate primrons or duprons on the right. The primron area is schematically connected to the dupron area by the large cables at the top and the bottom. Okay, so now if we imagine that we are this simplified conscious organism living in a totally contrived environment, encountering a green square or a floating green tile, we assume that its visual system has locked on to it. Its eyes have focused on it, and they're trying to interrogate this encounter to, to discern what it is. The corresponding neurons or groups of neurons that correspond to vertical edges and horizontal edges become active, i.e. the data primitives or primrons have become active. 
And because at this specific moment our awareness is actively engaged with this specific object and no other objects, these specific primrons are further stimulated or hyperstimulated by the central activating system. The first rule is that whenever a primron is hyperstimulated by the central activating system, its corresponding dupron becomes stimulated. The second rule is that whenever a number of duprons become stimulated at the same time, a type of binding neuron develops to link them together. Because it's linking visual or tactile patterns, I like to call these pattern neurons or patrons. So in this case, we'll assume that these three duprons correspond to the visual information of the green tile. Similarly, as we consciously engage this green tile object, we're also going to experience tactile sensations from our hands. These will result in the growth of another patron. Lastly, we'll also assume it has some associated odor. Now, after the entire object has been experienced, another upper level patron or abron for object neuron develops and binds or ensembles the underlying patrons and duprons. Not only does the abron ensemble all of the co-occurring duprons and patrons, but it also forms a link with the central activating system. The same is true for patrons. This is basically how memories are created. So that's a quick look at the major pieces of the scheme. To get a better idea of how the overall system works, we're going to consider one of the two common first-person thought processes that I mentioned in the first video, automatic memory stimulation. But rather than cover that in this video, we'll wrap things up here and save it for the next one. Before we do, I just want to emphasize a couple of points. As was the case with primrons, we should assume that the activity of a dupron is the result of a group or column of actual neurons. A typical column of neurons can consist of anywhere from 100 to 10,000 neurons in very close proximity. Similarly, the binding work of a single patron or abron shouldn't be viewed as being the result of a single neuron, but more likely arising from a number of linking neurons that together act like the schematic version. I'd like to add a few details to the workings of the central activating system as well, but we'll cover that in greater detail in the following video when we get a better view of it in action. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.